What's up, what's up? Hello everybody, hope you guys are doing good. Today, we're gonna have Riley from my team at The Garage Learning walk you through everything you might ever wanna know about LEDs. The science of them, how you could use them, and even more importantly, how you could build your own LEDs at home. Hi, I'm Riley with The Garage Learning, and today we're gonna to discuss the theory behind LED lights. So what is an LED? An LED, or light emitting diode, is a semiconductor light source that emits light when current runs through it. A traditional light, um, let's say a tungsten light, has a filament inside of it, and it runs current through that filament, heating it up until it glows, producing light. LEDs differ in the sense that they don't have a filament, um, they don't burn out nearly as often, and they use much less electricity. They don't need a filament because the light being emitted from the LED comes from electricity itself moving through the semiconductor material. The material just emits light when electrons run through it. And LEDs don't burn out either. They can last up to like 20 times longer than a light bulb of a similar output. And this isn't new tech, LEDs have been around since the 60s. When compared to other lights, LEDs stand out in a variety of different ways. For one, LEDs can be designed to generate pretty much any color on the visible spectrum, whereas traditional lights need gels or filters to achieve the same result. There are lots of lights on the market that allow you to dial in any color you want using multiple LEDs of different colors. These lights use a mix of red, green, and blue chips, as well as sometimes white LEDs. Dialing in their color is done with a controller. That's something we'll get into later. Furthermore, when an incandescent light bulb turns off, its glow sticks around for a minute. And when it turns on, it takes a minute to get the temperature. LEDs don't have to do this because of how they work. The chips can turn on and off instantly. LEDs high power density means that an LED head can be much smaller than, say, a tungsten light of the same output. A downside to LEDs can be their CRI. CRI, in technical terms, is the ability of a light source to reveal colors of objects accurately, compared to the sun's ability to do the same thing. Basically, CRI is how real the color looks. CRI's scale goes from 0 to 100, with 0 being lights of very poor color rendition, and 100 being lights with great color rendition, like natural sunlight. Basically, the lower the CRI, the poorer quality of the light. Most LEDs nowadays range from 75 all the way up to 98 CRI, which is pretty good, but it's not tungsten, which can have a CRI of 100. Perfect color rendition, although the color temperature is warmer compared to the sun. This is why some still prefer other light sources to LEDs. Even though high CRI LEDs with CRIs over 90 exist, they can be very costly. In fact, High quality LEDs are expensive in the first place due to the cost of the semiconductor material itself. The fact that they're new and cool and hip doesn't really help the fact. Um, tons of LED lights nowadays are super expensive and that is one of the reasons why we make our own lights. Making our own lights also gives us control over their form factor, their weight, their light output, their light quality. Also, with the small form factor our lights are in, we can move them around at high speed on our robots. So in general, you're gonna find two types of light sources out there hard lights and soft lights, what's the difference? Well, hard lights are more like spotlights. All of the light is coming from one central place, uh, kind of like this thing here. Whereas soft lights like this panel have tons of small lights spread out evenly across them to create a more even, spread out, softer light beam. So you're probably familiar with these LED strips or the LED strips on our panel, but you're also probably wondering, uh, what the heck is this thing? This is called a COB or chip on board. A COB is basically a circuit on a circuit board, like you'd find in any computer. But here, instead of a CPU or RAM, a bunch of tiny LEDs are being grouped together in an array in a super dense method. So basically, this circuit board here is how we go from a ton of tiny, tiny, tiny little grouped LEDs to a positive and a negative path that we can solder to. The way COBs are manufactured means that they can come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. COBs are actually found all over the place. Um, in fact, this LED strip, the lights on it, those are just tiny COBs. So now that we've talked a little bit about the LED, let's talk about how to power them. All LEDs need a DC power source. It can be a battery or an AC to DC power supply. Electrons flow from the negative terminal at the power source through the LED chip to the positive terminal at the power source. As they flow through the chip, the LED emits light. 
LEDs are diodes, meaning they only flow power in one direction, so the power source has to be DC. Well, what does that even mean? Basically, there are two types of current. There's AC and DC. AC stands for alternating current, and DC stands for direct current. Now, the way electricity works is there are electrons flowing through the circuit, and in alternating current, the electrons alternate which directions they're going back and forth really, really quickly. There's no one direction to the circuit. The circuit goes in both ways really quickly. And the benefit of this is basically it allows electricity to travel really long distances. So basically what the power supply does is converts the AC voltage from the wall into DC voltage for the LED itself. These power supplies can differ dramatically in price and quality. Now, even if we could use AC voltage torn LEDs, we wouldn't want to. Wall power is dangerous and can hurt you. Low voltage DC systems are safer. Loose wires need to be closer to arc and won't zap you nearly as bad if you somehow drop them in water. The only downside is that over longer cable runs, voltage can drop due to resistance and power can be lost. What is resistance? Well, in order to talk about resistance, we're gonna need to talk about voltage and amperage as well. So this power supply converts 120 volts AC from the wall to 36 volts DC at three amps. Let's break that down. So bear with me for a minute. We're gonna think about electricity as a water pipe. So there's water flowing through the pipe and there are a few things to think about. There's the water pressure, there's the pipe size, and there's the amount of flow. Voltage or pressure is the force pushing the electricity. Amperage or the amount of flow is how much electricity is actually going through. Resistance or the pipe size is the force restricting the electricity. We're not really gonna talk about resistance a lot because in these small circuits, there's not much resistance at all. One thing we will talk about though is wattage. Wattage is total power and is equal to volts times amps. Now, an important thing to remember is power supplies have a voltage and an amperage rating. Therefore, they have a rating for wattage. An important thing to remember when designing LED circuits is that the power supply has to be strong enough, has to have enough wattage to power this chip fully. So you can figure this out with some math. Firstly, every LED has a max power in watts consumed by the chip at a stable operating voltage. Let's focus on this COB for a minute. It's rated for 100 watts at 36 volts. This means when designing our circuit, we want a 36 volt power supply. Sure, the chip might turn on at 30 volts, but it won't reach its 100 watt potential until you give it the full 36 volts. So we've chosen our 36 volt power supply, but we need to make sure our power supply can supply enough power for this 100 watt chip. Since we know watts equals amps times volts, we can do this by dividing the wattage of the COB by the 36 volts that needs to run on, and we get about 2.8 amps. So this COB will pull 2.8 amps at its max power. This power supply is rated for three amps. Perfect. So I'm gonna put this off to the side for a second. And you probably notice that this light also has a fan and a heatsink on it. You're probably wondering, why do you need to cool the LED? I thought it was efficient. Does it even burn out? Unfortunately, yes, if it gets too hot, it does burn out. And well, yes, it's efficient, but the fact of the matter is that LEDs produce heat. And this particular LED is very power dense. What I mean by this is that 100 watts is being used up by this chip in this tiny one inch by one inch square area. That is a lot of power in a tiny area meaning that this COB does not have nearly enough contact with air to be cooled passively. LED strips, on the other hand, like the ones we use for our panels, have a power density of about 18 watts per meter. So basically, you need five meters of LED strip just to use the same amount of power as this chip. These LEDs are such low power density that their surface area and contact with air alone is enough to keep them cooled. The LED strip has so much contact with air that the air absorbs the heat and the chip stays cool. Furthermore, on the back of our LED panels, we have an aluminum panel that acts as a heatsink and gives even more contact with air, keeping our panels cool to the touch when operating. So this fan here is considered active cooling. The heat from the LED chip is conducted via the heatsink into these fins, and then the fan here blows away the hot air from the inside of the fins. You'll see this fin design with a lot of heat sinks because it actually gives a lot, a lot of surface area um, and a lot more contact with air than say, just like a block of metal. Air can get all the way up in these gaps, absorb all the heat from the chip and then get blown away by the fan. This process, which we call active cooling, keeps the LED at a stable temperature. Our LEDs at the studio use water cooling. It's a similar process to air cooling. The heat is transferred into the water, which is cooled by a chiller. But in this case, water is pumped through a hollow aluminum block that the LED sits on. The heat flows into the block, then into the water, where it's pumped all the way into the tank for chilling. This is why you always see green water hoses all over our sets. Now that we've talked about what an LED needs to operate, let's talk about powering them, specifically dimming them. 
you'll notice that lots of LED lights, when dimmed, appear to flicker in high-speed video. Why? Well, they're actually flickering, not dimming. Most LED dimmers out there use something called PWM, pulse width modulation, to dim the chip. By turning the power supply on and off super quickly, it can actually give the effect of dimming to the naked eye. In reality though, it's just flickering the power really quickly. PWM's control is called duty cycle. Duty cycle is basically just how long the power is on and how long the power is off. So for example, a 50% duty cycle, the light would be on 50% of the time, it would appear to be 50% brightness. Whereas with the 10% duty cycle, the light would be on a 10th of the time and look like it's a 10th brightness. So basically most LED dimmers flicker. The simple way to avoid this is by using a power supply just to power your LED with no dimming. But there's another option. Voltage dimming is dimming the LED by changing the voltage it gets. If you remember from earlier, we explained that a chip rated for 36 volts might even just barely turn on at 30 volts. At lower voltages, LEDs output dimmer light. Voltage dimming is complicated though, and it has some downsides to it. For example, CRI. The CRI of an LED can be affected by what voltage it's operating on. The LED is only guaranteed to have its rated CRI at its rated operating voltage. If you run the voltage any lower than that, the CRI could be affected. Fortunately, that's not a problem we have with the chips we have here or the strips we use, but that is something to keep in mind when you're designing LEDs. If you're interested in voltage dimming, stay tuned for our electronics course coming soon. Thanks for watching, I hope you learned something, and I'll see you in the comments.